Hello, everyone. We are about to start our medicine webinar quite shortly. Uh, we're just waiting a few of our panelists to arrive, as well as, of course, a few of you guys to arrive as well. So I'll just quickly see. Oh, yeah, we have people joining us right as we speak. Perfect. Now, uh, in the meantime, as we're waiting for our panelists to join in, along with our tutors, uh, would everyone that are attending, um, can you guys share with me where you guys are from in the chat? I'll just quickly see if the chat box, uh, chat box is enabled. Yes, it, it should be. Oh, no, actually, um, let me just change that. Okay, so now you guys should be able to write things on the chat. So, yes, just please share with me where you guys are attending from. Are you guys from the UK, anywhere else in the world? Do let us know. Don't be shy. We need your uh, participation tonight. Okay, UK, York, Manchester, London. All right, Southwest UK. A lot of UK students. All right, Birmingham. Uh, London, Manchester. All right, Essex, London, London, UK. All right, a lot, a lot of UK students this time. Um, I'll just quickly see. Oh, I one Ireland. Okay, um, Leeds. All right, Reading. Very good. I'll just quickly see if um, if we have the presentation. One second. Now, uh, just uh, as a side note, everyone, um, if you have any questions throughout the webinar. Uh, please put them into the Q&A box instead of the chat box, because towards the end of the webinar, we will be having a Q&A session. So it will be very easy for us to go through all of your questions uh, towards the end of the webinar. Um, and so that, you know, everything is in one place. It's going to make things a lot easier. So let's see. Yep. Now we have Paul. Paul, are you ready to share the slides? Uh, can you hear me, Paul? I don't think he can. So I can hear you. Sorry. Yeah. Awesome. So can you please share the slides if you have them? Apologies for the late start there. Be right with you. All right. So. While we are waiting, um, can you write to us in the chat? chat what universities are you thinking of applying to so write to us in the chat quickly what universities are you thinking of applying to and we'll get started very shortly we've got quite a lot of you in here so we've got somebody saying oxford uh ucl oxford or cambridge cambridge imperial cambridge a lot of cambridge uh oxford imperial edinburgh or queens kings cambridge oxford potentially bristol or imperial keel cambridge imperial ucl a lot of wow, fantastic. Okay, Bart's Leeds QCL, um, Edinburgh, and Bristol. Here, uh, since everyone's considering Cambridge, apparently. Yeah, well, actually, you you're basically completely in the right place because we specialize in medicine and we specialize in Oxbridge. And Maya here, who Jancy is just about to introduce, is a Cambridge medic, and we've got an Oxford medic joining us later. So I think we've got some fantastic people. I'll hand over to Jansu. Thanks, Jansu. Yeah um okay so um again welcome everyone so um as i mentioned before but for those that have just joined to the webinar if you have any questions please put them in the q a box and towards the end of the webinar we will be having a q a session so just to let you know okay so shall we get to the introduction poll uh for the next slide okay so i just wanted to quickly introduce who we are so, um, well, you're at the Oxbridge formula. We've been running around seven years. We specialize in Oxbridge applications along with um, medicine applications for pretty much every university. Um, so on the left corner, also the lady that just spoke before me, uh, she's our founder. Uh, her name is Parul. Uh, she studied at Oxford herself. Uh, she studied maths there, uh, graduated within top 5% of her year. And she was a teacher for a really long time, actually. Um, and uh, and then she started the Oxford formula to help students in a way to make well competitive applications to their universities. Then we have our lovely tutor Maya in the second hand. Uh, Maya, do you want to say hi? Hi, everyone. 
Maya is one of our tutors uh, working with us. She is a Cambridge medic. Uh, so she uh, prepared a really good presentation for you guys. And then on the third photo right here, we have Grace, who is our um, Oxford um, medic, let's say. She'll be joining uh, with us later on. And then uh, we have Paul, who's our lead consultant. Paul, do you wanna say hi? Hi, everybody. <laughs> Quickly introduce yourself, please. Hi, uh, I'm not a medic. Uh, for my sins, I read PPE, but uh, that was uh, a long time ago. Um, and uh, I really look forward to talking to you, lots of you soon, and uh, get you on board with our fantastic programs. Exactly. And on the right, well, that's me. Uh, my name is Jansu. Um, I am one of the hosts here tonight, and also I'm a programs consultant here at the Oxford Formula. So if you do book in a consultation with us in the future, you'll be meeting me with either Paul and myself. So let's quickly go over what we'll be covering today. So we have a lot uh, in today's schedule. So first of all, we will be discussing medicine and the degree itself. I'm sure you've seen a lot of types of degrees when it comes to medicine. So don't worry, we'll, Maya will explain every single one of them to you guys. And of course, how to make your application. So every single university is a bit different from one another, but don't worry, we will be going through the entire application process for medicine. And then of course, the big ones. So the personal statement, admissions test and interviews. So what are these universities looking for in your personal statement? We will literally be going through it paragraph by paragraph. So I suggest that you guys stick around. Then we will be discussing uh, the big ones, UCAT and BMAT. So how can you actually get a competitive score in both of these tests? And then you guys have around three interviews, two, three interviews that you guys have to prepare. Uh, well, two or three types of interviews that you guys have to prepare. So we will be discussing all types of medicine interviews and um, well, how you should be preparing uh, for them as well. And then we'll also discuss some ways for you to strengthen your application as well. Now, um, I will say, I forgot to ask this, but uh, if you're attending as a student, uh, I would highly suggest that you have one of your parents attend to the webinar as well. Or if you're a parent attending, obviously to have the student because pretty much the entire family tends to be uh, involved in the preparation process. So it's very important that everybody's on, everybody's on the same page and knows exactly what kind of, a, a, I guess, route, route that you guys are about to take. Um, so, um, so yeah, Maya, tell us about the medicine degree. Okay, so I'm guessing if you guys are here, you're all looking to apply to medicine, uh, maybe next year, maybe the year after. Um, and there's lots and lots of different things to consider, but I guess some of the main reasons why you might be considering medicine, um, well, these are the most common reasons anyway, uh, there's so many different career paths that you can go down. Um, so you don't have to become a doctor at the end of it. Uh, there's lots of different options for you once you finish your degree. Some of those options we'll be going into a little bit later. You're obviously gonna have a lot of biology teaching. So you're gonna have to be interested in the human body, how it works, how it goes wrong, all of that type of science-y nitty gritty detail. You're gonna have uh, lots and lots of practical teaching. So medicine is a very hands-on degree and a very hands-on career. So you have to have good practical skills, be able to do things with your hands, um, but don't worry if you're not super confident in things like that, you're gonna get loads and loads of training. Placements, it's going to make up a massive proportion of your degree. Um, you're going to be spending so much time on the wards, observing doctors, observing other members of the multidisciplinary team and learning hands-on medicine from them. And then I think probably the main reason um, for a lot of you is that you want to have a positive influence in somebody's life. And we will talk about this a little bit later on. You know, you can't have a positive influence in everybody's life you can't help everyone you can't heal and you can't cure everybody but some people you will be able to and for those families you're going to have a massive difference on their their life well all these responsibilities would mean that the universities will also have very high expectations from you guys as well i'm sure a lot of you guys already know the medicine is very, very competitive to get in, but we just wanted to show you the numbers in a way. So in the UK, every year for medicine, there's around 29,000 applicants, but there's only 9,500 places available. So, which means the success rate of actually getting into medical school is around 30%. And that's just including every university in the UK. Now, if we, as we are the Oxbridge formula, if we take a look at the Oxbridge route, it tends to get more competitive. 
So for Cambridge, uh, every year there's around 2,000 applicants and they only have 250 places available. What, what does that mean? It means that you only have 12.5% success rate. And for Oxford, there's around 1,890 applicants and only 160 places available, which means the success rate is around 8.5. It actually was around 9%, but it fell down to 8.5 quite recently. And for both of the uh, Oxford unis, actually, um, we expect it to fall uh, with the coming years as well. Why? Well, we're going to discuss it in the next slide as well. Um, so, oh, let's discuss international students first of all, of course. Um, so, in the UK, there's around every year 5,200 uh, applicants uh, for international students for medicine, only 564 places available. So, already, if you guys are an international student, you only have 11% of success rate. Now, for Oxbridge, this falls down to 4% or 3.5 respectively. So there's around 500 applicants for Cambridge and 400 for Oxford, only 22 places available for Cambridge for medicine for international students and only 14 for Oxford. Now, there is a reason why it's getting a lot, a lot more competitive in the coming years. And that's because the number of applicants are increasing. Now, we just want to show the, um, what it's like for the other universities. So Manchester, another Russell Group University, a very reputable university. Um, so every year they have around 119 international places available for medicine, around 37 of them interviewed and only 17% of those students received offers. So as you, can, as you guys can see, when it comes to medicine, if you're, if you're an international student in particular, it is a lot more competitive compared to the UK students. Um, yeah, so we just want to show it for Oxbridge as well. As you guys can see, there's close to 4,000 applicants. Um, only 1,200, let's say, are interviewed, and then less than 500 are successful. And I believe that the right side, I can't see it on my end, but it's for Oxford. Um, and yeah, there's around uh, 1,100 applications every year, only around 100 or so are interviewed, and then less than that is only successful. So it's very, very competitive. Yeah, just to quickly say, and um, that was for international students on the, the second one. Um, yeah. Yeah, so uh, at Oxford in general, um, oh, yes, it's a lot more competitive at international universities than it is uh, for, from international countries than from the UK. And again, there is a reason why it's getting more and more competitive every year is because in the next slide, um, you guys can see the number of applications increasing. So this is for Cambridge. So as you guys can see, in 2017, there was around 1,300 applicants. In 2021, they had more than 2,000. So that's a drastic increase within just three years, three, four years. So however, if you guys take a look at the total number of offers and acceptances, they remained quite similar. They may have increased maybe one, two, three spaces, but they remain quite similar. So that's one of the reasons why the success rate is keep going down. Um, so it's making the process a lot more competitive for you guys. It makes it a lot harder for students to differentiate themselves. So that's when the BMAT and the interviews play a really big role in terms of your application. And let's go to the next slide. Yeah, so, but we just want to discuss the medicine degree itself a little bit more. So Maya, tell us about the training pathways. Yeah, definitely. So we've talked about the degree, we've talked about how competitive it is, but what happens after you've done your degree? So depending on the university that you go to, it will be uh, in the UK, it will be either a five or six year long course. Then after that, everybody enters into this training pathway called the foundation years, which is two years long and you spend it rotating around different departments and different specialities you kind of get a taste of everything so some examples are on the screen so for example pediatrics or cardiology for example after that you get to choose the speciality that you want to specialize in if you want to be a clinical doctor so you choose for example you want to be a gp you enter the gp training pathway and depending on the choice that you take, this will be anywhere between three and seven years long. But you are working this entire time. It's a job, but it's also a training pathway at the same time. 
which I think is really great because you're sort of continually learning throughout your degree, sorry, throughout your career. There's always something new to work towards. After this, you will finally become a consultant, which is what everybody talks about. And once you get to the stage, you obviously have the option of going into private practice and private medicine if that's what you want to do. And then something I just wanted to add is that education and teaching is going to be present throughout your entire career. So you're going to be learning in medical school. And after you graduate medical school, you're going to be helping to teach others. So it's going to be a constant thread throughout the rest of your life. Uh, so it's something to get used to and something to really enjoy. Now, the, there's one thing very interesting about studying medicine is that there's, there isn't one way to actually make it into medical school, right? So what are the alternative ways to get a medicine degree? Yeah, definitely. So there's lots and lots of different pathways into medicine. You don't have to go through the sort of traditional routes if you don't want to. So the first pathway that a lot of people talk about is a transfer course. And this is where you do a science based degree for three years. So a lot of options are things like biomedical science, biochemistry, things like that. And then you apply to medical school and you get to transfer into a medical course but a few years in, so you don't have to do the full five years, for example. This is a really good pathway, but it's only offered by some universities and can be very competitive. So just do your research before considering this pathway. The next one is foundation courses. So these are becoming more and more popular, which I think is a really good thing. And essentially, if you, are, you go to a university where the course is traditionally five years, you add an extra year on. And essentially this extra foundation year helps you get up to speed to everybody else's level and you learn just general science material so that you will be able to hit the ground running when you join the regular five-year medicine course. Okay, oh, and yeah, it's uh, usually targeted, targeted at people who haven't had equal opportunities uh, when they're at school. And then graduate courses. So I'm not sure if there are any graduates on the uh, webinar today, but essentially if you already have a degree, then you have the option to enter an accelerated course, again, only offered at some universities. Um, and this is usually three or four years long and you just squeeze everything that everybody else does in five years into a shortened period of time. So they're quite intense courses, but it means that you start working a bit faster. And now, oh, so you were gonna- Sorry, carry on, Jensen, sorry. Uh, so one, there is uh, one, I would say, advantage of studying medicine at Oxbridge, which is the interclassian year, which is very unique. So yeah, Maya, let us know about the interclassian year. Definitely. So the reason that some courses are six years rather than five years is because some universities, such as Oxford and Cambridge, offer this extra third year where you take a year out from the traditional medicine course and you spend it studying a completely different subject. So for most people, this is science related. So something like pathology or anatomy or psychology, but it doesn't have to be. Uh, so people go off and study humanities or business or physics whatever it is they want to do and essentially this gives you the opportunity and the freedom to really dig deep into a specific topic and subject that you're really really interested in an extra perk is that you get two degrees so with this extra year you get an extra degree so um, that's always really really good for applications and things like that in the future um, and yeah I think it's a really good opportunity um, to really get your nails into something that you're interested in. And some universities offer a research project alongside this as well. Um, and if you're really lucky, then you might get your name on a research paper, um, which is an amazing opportunity. Um, so if you're interested in research and you're interested in science and academics, definitely consider a university that offers this integrated year. And for medicine, there's so many degree types out there. So are there any differences between these degree types? And if so, what are those? Let us know. Yeah, definitely. So when you're doing your research, you might come across some different letters and terminology. Um, essentially, this is this slide just is just to let you know, don't worry about it. They all mean the same thing. They're all a medicine degree and they're all recognized by the General Medical Council, which is the sort of governing body uh, for med medicine in the UK. So don't worry about it. Um, that's just what this slide is for. Thank you very much. <clears throat> now, obviously, we've got different uh, different degrees. Uh, there's also different teaching methods uh, on uh, on offer. So, 
Perhaps you could tell uh, our audience a little bit about the different ways in which the medical course is taught, depending upon the university you're at. Definitely. So this is something really to spend a lot of time researching because it differs between each university. Each university has a slightly different style uh, in which they teach their medicine course. And seeing as you're going to be spending six years studying at this university, you want to make sure that the university you go to teaches in a way that is most optimum for your learning style. So you might hear, have heard some of these words floating around. Integrated learning is a really, really common method of teaching. It's what most medical schools are using these days. And essentially it means that you're learning science and, and theory alongside the clinical and the practical elements. So for example, on Monday morning, you go and have a lecture on the respiratory system and the lungs. And then Monday afternoon, you go onto the ward and you go into a respiratory clinic and you learn about the practical applications of what you learn in your lecture in clinical practice. So how is that theory translated across to actually practicing as a doctor? Um, I think it's a really good method of teaching, especially if you like to have quite a lot of variety in your week. Problem-based learning. So this is a really new method of um, learning. And oh, we've got a lot of things here. <laughs> um, and essentially it means that you are independently learning. It's a very self-directed and it's essentially, you don't have many lectures, you don't have traditional teaching per se. Instead, you're going to be given a clinical problem and there's lots of group work and you have to work through the clinical problem yourself with your peer group. You might have to go and do some independent reading. So essentially, if you like self-directed learning and you like guiding what you're interested in, then definitely problem-based learning is an option for you. Great, thank you. So problem-based learning, you're working with problems all the time. The problem essentially is the patient. What about the sort of uh, teaching you're going to get at Oxbridge? Yeah, so Oxford and Cambridge offer traditional teaching. Some other universities do, but it's traditionally Oxford and Cambridge. And essentially, this means that you're spending two or three years learning completely science-based, lecture-based, lab-based teaching before spending your last three years in what we call clinical school, where you're solely based in the hospital and in wards learning practical skills. So it's very lecture heavy. Um, so if you know that you like being told information that you have to absorb, then that's great for you. And essentially it allows you to have a good basis of knowledge before going out onto the wards, which is why I really like this method of learning. Something specific to Oxford and Cambridge are these things called supervisions and tutorials. So these are specialized small group teaching with an expert in the field of the topic that you're learning about. And you can go and write essays, ask them questions. They'll help you learn and understand the topic in even more detail. And these are a really, really good learning opportunity. And then just a side point is that at Cambridge only, not at Oxford, you get offered cadaveric dissection, also known as full body dissection. Um, and this as well is a really good learning opportunity to help further those anatomy skills even more. So if that's something that you think you're gonna be interested in, then definitely consider that when doing your research. Thank you. I think I'm about to donate two small dogs to get a very dissertation <laughs> dissection. But um, thank you for that. So I think we've established that the, each university can control the structure of the course, the title of the course, and the way the degree is course. And I guess that means they get to decide how they assess you at the end of it as well. Definitely. Um, so again, just something to look at when you're doing your research. Different universities like to test you in different ways. So have a think about which method of testing you perform best in. It shouldn't form a massive part of your research. It's just something to think about. But commonly used methods are written exams, so writing essays and short answer questions, multiple choice, multiple choice tests, um, practical exams. These are lab-based problem-solving exams. OSCEs, these are clinical exams where you have to go and demonstrate your clinical skills. And then obviously there will be some element of coursework involved as well. Thank you. It sounds uh, it sounds punishing. <laughs> right. So that's the assessment style. That's great. Now, can you tell us a little bit about preclinical and placement? I've been various friends who've been medics and uh, I still don't understand this difference. So please over to you. Definitely. So these are words you're probably going to hear so many times over the next few years. So it's definitely a good idea to understand what they mean. So when someone says 
preclinical. It's the few years, the two or three years before you enter your clinical skills. And this is in the context of traditional learning. So this is when you're doing your two to three years focusing on science and theory only. And then after that, um, you'll go onto your clinical placements uh, where you are rotating around wards, GP practices, hospitals, surgeries, and learning the different types of hands-on practical medicine from doctors and nurses and physios, et cetera, on the ward. And again, some universities offer this, some don't. There is often an option for a medical elective in fourth and fifth year. And this is the opportunity to go and spend a few months abroad in another country, learning the practical applications of medicine in a different country. Um, I know lots of people like to go to Australia or Southeast Asia, America. Um, it's definitely something to look forward to. Yeah, a friend of mine spent her elective in Vietnam and said it was one of the most extraordinary experiences of her life. Um, fantastic. Now, you've got your medical degree. What happens now? Do you, do you, are you automatically a doctor? No, unfortunately not. Um, so we talked a little bit about this at the start and the different things that are going to happen. So you're going to enter, you're going to get your uh, medical license after sitting the central exam. Uh, Everyone across the UK, by the time that you graduate, will be taking this exam. It's called the Medical Licensing Assessment. And essentially, this means that everybody will be ranked across the country. And they use these ranks to help allocate junior doctor jobs. So everybody will have a license and everybody will have a job. It just uh, might differ in terms of where it is. So traditionally, London-based hospitals are often in high demand and the different specialities that you might be rotating uh, within. And then after that, you have a short summer break after your fifth year, and then you start your FY1 year, also known as your foundation year one. Thank you. So what we're looking at then is the application timeline. Let's look at the actual application timeline. Um, can you talk us through this bit? Definitely. So we are just at the end of October now for those of you who are in year 12 or your first year of A-levels. So from October to July, you're going to, well, July next year, you're going to want to be delegating a lot of time to boosting your application. So doing things like work experience, doing extracurriculars to boost some skills, which I'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, you don't really want to be worrying too much about things like interviews at this point in time. Just try and boost that application as much as possible. Then next summer, you want to make sure that you've done all your work experience so that you can then write your personal statement. This takes a lot longer than you might think it does. So you're going to need the full summer of free time to put towards writing that personal statement. You're also going to want to set your UCAT and your BMAT, which we are going to talk about a little bit later on. Then next year in November, you set your BMAT if you choose to take it. And then from December to March, you will receive interview offers and then go and attend those interviews. And once you've done your interviews, so from March 2024, you will be receiving offers. Um, you accept them, sit your A-level exams and hopefully get a place at medical school. Thank you very much. Over to Jansu. Yes, yeah, so we just wanted to show you guys the timeline a little bit more in depth. So you guys will have your uh, UCAS deadline um, at October 15, uh, of course, next year. Um, and then you guys can sit, well, Ox Oxford does not use the UCAT exam, but if you're applying for any other non-Oxford universities, then most likely you're gonna have to sit the UCAT exam, which you can sit between June and September of uh, the summer of year 12. And then when it comes to BMAT, there used to be two sittings, uh, but now they're just changed to only one sitting, which will most likely take place next October, mid-October, around the time that you guys submit your UCAS applications. Um, and then, well, for non-Oxbridge universities, the interviews tend to take place between December and March. And for Oxbridge, you'll be doing your interviews in December and pretty quickly in, around mid-January, you will uh, see if you've gotten an offer or not. And for other universities, they like to announce their um, offers between March and July, as we just mentioned. Can I just ask a very quick question before you carry on, Jansu, to the audience? Um, what year are you guys in? Are you going to be starting university in 2023 or are you going to be starting university in 2024? And it was just in, in, interesting because 
knowing that will help us pitch the webinar in the right way. So a lot of people at 2024, oh, brilliant, loads of 2020. Everyone's pretty much, 20, oh, 2025 as well. Okay, loads of 2024. We've got a couple of people here, 2023. This is still very, very useful information for you. But I'm glad that all of you 2024 people are here early enough so that you can actually make a massive impact on your application. Brilliant, thanks. Exactly. Also, uh, for the 2023 entry ones, uh, I'll 100% recommend that you stay around for the interviews because I'm sure those are coming up shortly for you all. Now, yeah, in the next slide, so we just want to again put the um, timeline a little bit more clearly. So as Maya mentioned before, so between uh, Year in the autumn of year 12, around spring, until actually July, you want to do a lot of work experience, volunteering experience. We'll get into more detail on those subjects. Again, as we mentioned, between June and September, you can sit the UCAT exam. Then you're going to have to write your personal statement around the summertime, which is very important for medicine students. We're about to get into the details of the personal statement as well. Um, then the BMAT test takes place in October, as we mentioned, and the interviews in around December and the offers start coming out, uh, starting with Oxford offers around January. Um, um, so let's discuss a personal statement. So you guys said after the work experience, it's uh, the second least challenging one in the poll. And so you have one personal statement and you're applying multiple universities. So tell us, Maya, how can we make this applicable uh, for every single university? Okay, so just some basic information about the personal statement, just to get us kicked off. You've probably heard a lot about it. You probably heard the old years talking about it. It's this big scary essay that you have to write. It's really nothing to be afraid of. Um, essentially, it's 47 lines or 4,000 characters, including spaces, all about you. It's about you, why you want to study medicine, what have you done? to you know prove to them that you're going to be a good doctor why should they choose you out of everyone else so you know it shouldn't be something scary to think about um it's actually a really easy thing to write as we've said you only get one personal statement for four medical schools so it is a little bit of a balancing game trying to make it applicable to all four medical schools especially those of you who want to apply to oxbridge Okay, so before we delve into the paragraph by paragraph breakdown of what to include in your personal statements, just a little side note about Oxbridge personal statements and why they're different. So Oxford and Cambridge are world renowned uh, research universities. They are well known for their high quality scientific teaching. So in your personal statement, you have to detail to them why in particular do you find science so interesting? Why do you want to dedicate two to three years of that degree learning just science and, and just mechanisms behind disease? What is it that you have done or seen that has said to you that you really want to do this? As well as that, if you can reference research and the research aspect of the universities, that's really great as well. So if you've done any research projects or been to a conference or something along those lines, I'd pop that in as well. Okay, so now onto our paragraph by paragraph breakdown, what to include. So your first paragraph is obviously going to be your introduction. It shouldn't be, you know, very long at all. Essentially, the only thing you need to include in this paragraph is why you want to do medicine. You know, for a lot of people, there will be a specific moment in time that really solidified their desire to want to study medicine. For other people, there may not be a, you know, specific experience or a humbling or a humbling experience or a family experience, you know, there may not be anything, but try and sit down and really reflect on what is it that makes you want to study medicine in particular. Please don't waffle on in this, this section. Uh, it should only be a few lines long. Just try and be really brief with what is your motivation. Sorry, hang on. Ooh, where's it gone? There we go. Okay, so experience paragraphs. So this is where medicine personal statements differ from other personal statements for other subjects. So no one else will be including experience paragraphs, but for you guys, this is the most important section of your personal statement. So essentially you need to describe and explain relevant experience that you've had with reflection. So for a lot of you, this will be work experience and volunteering, essentially anything that is either medically oriented or people oriented. What did you do and what did you learn from that experience? Why has that experience motivated you to want to become a doctor? 
in this section, please, please don't talk about wanting to save lives or wanting to help people. They're like massive cliches. The admission stuff, read them over and over again. It's just not worth it. They're more interested in knowing what you learn from the people that you met and how are you a changed person because of the experiences that you had. Yeah, and you know, you just want to have to um, demonstrate understanding as a career of the whole, as, well, as, as a whole in this section. Okay, the next paragraph is your supercurricular paragraph. And notice how I say supercurricular rather than extracurricular. And this paragraph is essentially going to list anything that you've done outside of your A-level curriculum that has given you skills or qualities that will make you a good doctor. So for example, have you done any projects or been part of a research organization or have you been volunteering somewhere or have you been on a sports team? Anything along those lines, sorry. And in that section, you want to include as much reflection as possible. So they're not really interested in what you did. It's more, what did you learn from those experiences? <clears throat> right. The next paragraph is your academic paragraph. So this is kind of specific for those of you applying to Oxford and Cambridge. And in this paragraph, you want to detail that you understand what a doctor's daily life is going to be like. You understand that you are about to embark on a six year long training and learning program and you understand that. Detail especially why you're interested in the science and I've talked about research already. And in this section, um, oh dear. All right. And that's okay. So in this section, if you've read any books, you can include them here. Um, but I would say that it's not super necessary for medicine personal statements to read. Okay, and then your conclusion should be really, really short. You're probably running out of characters by this point. You just want to demonstrate maturity and understanding that what you're about to embark on is a life choice. It is a vocation. What are you going to contribute to the university? And why should the university pick you out of everybody else? And also just some kind of um, acceptance that it's not going to be easy from now on. But despite all of these points, why do you still want to be a doctor? And then just summarize your points. Thank you very much. So a couple of things that are really coming through here is that in this particular section, what you need to demonstrate is evidence of your work experience in volunteering and some sort of argument that demonstrates you've given this some serious thought and uh, you're very serious about becoming a doctor, you know everything that's coming, you know it's going to be a really hard work and that's not just after university. Um, can we drill a little bit more please into work experience? It's one of the things obviously that came up in the poll, uh, it's something that people are seriously concerned about. So uh, what, sort of, what sort of work experience should people be looking for? How do you get it and how do you reflect on it I suppose? Definitely. So work experience is really, really important for medicine personal statements. It's also really important just to gain some experience of the vocation that you're about to embark on. And they're great to talk about um, at interview as well. So in terms of how to get work experience, first start by asking family and friends. Um, it's probably the easiest way if you have medical connections. But for those of you who don't, so I didn't have anyone in my family who was a doctor, um, always look at the, your local NHS hospital and look on their website or call up the switchboard and ask to see if they offer established work experience programs already. A lot of hospitals do already and they're really easy to apply to. Um, because of the pandemic, there is starting to be a move to online work experience programs. And universities have confirmed that they will accept these um, as evidence of work experience. However, if you can get your hands on some in-person work experience, that's obviously going to be better. Um, don't be afraid to contact consultants directly. Look at their email, uh, find their email address in a department that you might be interested in. You never know, one of them might lead to a work experience placement. Essentially, don't worry too much about where it is. You know, it doesn't have to be in an operating theatre watching brain surgery. It, it really doesn't matter where it is. It's more about what you can get out of the experience. What can you learn from the experience? Thank oh, you. 
sorry, a side, sorry. side point, uh, some medical schools ask for a certain number of days. So make sure you're fulfilling that requirement if you need to. So there you go. You've got your work experience. You've worked incredibly hard. You've pulled all the strings. You've worked all of the angles. What do you do now? You're, you're standing there. What's the most important thing? Okay, so the most important thing to do in work experience is not to stand in a corner. Um, there is no point going there and not getting anything out of it. You have to be quite proactive and ask to see things, ask to speak to people. They speak to the doctors, but also speak to all other members of healthcare staff because they often can give you just as insightful information as a doctor could. A lot, uh, alongside that, please speak to patients. Um, they give you the other side, the other perspective, which I think is also really important to gain. Try and get out of them the pros and the cons of the job um, and try and understand that it's not always easy and it's not going to be an easy job. If there are any examples you can pull out of it as well. Um, yeah, some, you know, appreciating the complexities of caring for someone. I think you probably get the gist of what you're trying to get out of this experience. And a really good top tip is to take a notebook with you. Obviously, don't write down any confidential information or anything like that. But it's really useful to write down how you felt at the time when you were seeing something or when you spoke to someone. Because then when you get home, you can write a bit more of a diary and reflect on what you saw and how you felt about it. Because then when it comes to writing your personal statement in however many months time, you can use those feelings and use that reflection um, when writing that statement. Thank you. Yeah, again, reflection is something that comes up a lot in those weekly sessions. It's, it's that important. Um, a, a quick question about the difference really between work experience and volunteering. Where, where, do, you, where, do, we, where do we stand on that? Okay, so with volunteering, essentially this is any kind of experience working with people when you are actually hands-on and you are dealing with patients yourself. And honestly, this is a really good experience. And I, you know, some might argue that it's even better than work experience because you can see firsthand the difficulties that the different healthcare professionals have to deal with. And you can already start to develop some of those skills that healthcare professionals will need. So you know, still make sure you're reflecting when you're getting home, still making sure that you are writing down those thoughts. But if you can get your hands on any kind of volunteering, obviously in a hospital would be great, but it doesn't have to be. Think about care homes, sports clubs, kids clubs, nurseries. There's loads of places that are always desperate for volunteers. Anything interacting with people is going to be really valuable. Thank you very much. And just one thing before I hand over to Jan, so you, you did mention books earlier. Are there any in particular that you would uh, steer people towards or away from? Yeah, so with books, um, a lot of people ask about this. I think it really doesn't matter if you are interested in reading around the subject, then 100% go for it. But it's not necessary for your personal statement. Um, if you want to, 100% do. Uh, I've listed some of the really, really common medical school application books on the screen. You can make some notes if you want to. Um, if you want a bit of variety, have a look at documentaries and the series. It's called A Short Introduction To, and then they give introductions to lots of different topics. And they're quite nice to sort of give you an overview of a topic rather than reading a really dense book. Uh, look at articles, magazines, conferences, uh, documentaries, so things like Hospital and Ambulance on BBC are really good to get the same kind of insights. Right, admissions tests, Maya. So many questions. Um, shall we start off with perhaps the most fundamental, and that is the, the why. Why have admissions tests? Okay, so medicine, per, um, medicine as a degree have admissions tests, which most of the subjects don't because it adds an extra layer um, for the universities to dis distinguish between people. I think especially now, um, because of the pandemic, because GCSEs and A-levels are slightly skewed now, I think that um, doing well in your admissions assessments is going to mean that much more. Um, they also test completely different skills to those that you're going to be using in your IBs or your A-levels. So you definitely have to prepare for them. It's not something you can just rock up to and just hope to do well. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we've talked a lot about the, the BMAT and the UCAT. We, we haven't really explained 
the differences between them. So now would probably be a good time to uh, to tackle that. Definitely. So there's two admissions tests which are used for UK medical schools. Uh, each university will use a different one. So you can see on the table below uh, just some examples of different different universities that use each test. Um, for UCAT, there are a lot more universities. Most universities do use the UCAT. A select few, including Oxford and Cambridge, are using the BMAT at the moment. So traditionally, the UCAT is an aptitude test, whereas a, the BMAT is what's known as an academic aptitude test. So it's slightly more theory based. And you can choose to take both or uh, just one, depending on the choice of universities you're going to apply to. And with the UCAT, you can choose when you want to sit it because it's a computer based exam. You take it in a driving test center. Um, whereas when the BMAT has two sessions, I think next year, most likely will only have one session anyway. Um, and you go and you sit in person and you take it in a room full of people. Yeah, that's quite right. The the BMAT has, it was just one session this year, wasn't it? And the chances are it's going to be one session yeah. uh, going further. Um, another thing about the UCAT is that the, uh, the scoring system is um, notoriously complicated, I believe. Yeah, so the scoring system likes to change year on year, but essentially all you need to know is that you'll get your results immediately because it's computerised. Um, and each university has different kinds of requirements for the different scores. Um, the BMAT, so this year it was November 2nd, um, and different universities, so for example, Oxford, may have cutoff scores. So just bear those in mind when doing your preparation and doing your practice papers in terms of what types of scores you want to be aiming for. Right. So, yeah, we were talking about the UCAT there. I got a little ahead of myself. Um, a little bit more detail, please, about the UCAT, if you don't mind. OK, so the UCAT is an exam. It's two hours long. It's multiple choice test. It has five sections, um, verbal reasoning, decision making, quantitative reasoning, abstract reasoning and situational judgment. So I think you can tell from the names that each section tests something completely different. Um, as I've said, you take it in a driving test centre. And you're scored between 300 and 900 points for each section based on how many you get right. Um, and this will contribute to a final score, which then puts you into percentiles. So it's probably easiest to work in percentiles. You, If you're aiming for a score over 2,800, that will put you in the top 10% of the country, for example. Uh, for the fifth section, situational judgment, you get a band, so a band from one to four. So band one is the best, band four is the worst. Great, thank you very much. Um, and here are some of the universities that look for the UCAT. Yeah, um, in case anybody was interested, you can jot this down, but this information is available freely online. Yeah, so you've only got a handful of universities really that look at the BMAT, the UCAT much more widely, uh, widely used. Um, let's go into uh, some of those questions in a little bit more detail. So this is a question called verbal reasoning. So this is a category, sorry, uh, that we call uh, verbal reasoning. Quite a big chunk of test, text there that you would be ex expected to skim through uh, really quickly uh, and come up with an answer. Uh, just uh, have, Has anyone been able to read that yet? I'm guessing not, because you wouldn't really have a lot more time to read that in the UCAT question before you would be forced to answer that particular question. Does that timing about right, Maya? Yeah, it's very, very quick. <laughs> yeah, so you need to go through these really, really quickly. And again, this is where practice makes perfect. This never gets easy, but you do get better at it. Um, there's another type of question we've got here. That's uh, decision making. Again, something that I used to teach when I was uh, looking at uh, critical thinking. Um, Maya, any comments on this one? Yeah, so with decision making, there's lots of different types of questions. You can get better at each different question type. This is just one example that's essentially a word problem. You're given a few seconds and you have to pick which statement uh, you think is most accurate. Great. Here's another type. This is the quantitative reasoning. Again, over to the expert. Yeah, so this is essentially a math section. You do have a calculator in the UCAT, but it's very, very clunky and difficult to use. So I would brush up on your mental math skills. All of the questions you can do with just mental maths, um, but you don't have very long in this section at all. Thanks. Is the calculator really as bad as they say? 
Uh, I did not like it. I did not enjoy it at all. Uh, but you do get given a whiteboard to do sort of workings out on. But the whiteboard, you can't rub out the whiteboard marker. So just think of it as a piece of paper uh, um, and use that when you're practicing as well. Yeah, they're not making it easy for you, are they, at all? Uh, the next category of question that comes up is abstract reasoning. And um, yeah, I'm sorry, I have to hand this one back to you. Yeah, to be honest, I probably couldn't explain this one to you right now anyway, but essentially it's something along these lines, you get given different shapes and there's different question types and you have to choose which set uh, your test shape goes into or you have to choose the odd one out or something along those lines. Uh, this one definitely is, just takes practice and you will get better at it. Yeah, this one perhaps is a little bit more accessible to the lay person, perhaps one that you can start talking about at home with uh, with mums and dads. Um, so this is situational judgment. Yeah, so essentially this is the section where you're given lots of different scenarios. You have a little bit more time. It's not as time pressured and they're usually medically based and you get given questions that you have to rank um, responses to, if that makes sense. So for example, in this scenario, for those of you that have read it, you have to uh, say how important it is for Georgina to take into consideration the chance that somebody else may already be dealing with the crying patient. And you have to uh, decide whether it's very important, important of minor importance or not important at all. There are tips and tricks for this um, section. And again, if you learn some ethics rules, this section should be absolutely fine. Thank you. So the UCAT generally is going to be sat. We we think I found most uh, most of our most of our students sat it in, in about August, if I remember correctly. Um, this is a campaign essentially running over several months. If we were to say these are the most important ideas to focus on, we would direct you towards these particular uh, these particular qualities. Um, six months. How, well, so how much preparation would you put towards these, and um, you know, what would be your advice? Okay, so 100% you want to get your hands on a online question package. Uh, if you sign up to our programs, then you get access to questions. Um, and essentially, you just want to practice, practice, practice. I would say that more practice done over a longer period of time is much better than trying to cram it into a few weeks before the exam. So the earlier that you start, the better and the easier it will become. Just doing a little bit every day absolutely helps. Um, I've talked about the online calculator and the whiteboard. And essentially, if you get familiar with the different question types, it will get easier. Thanks, Maya. I'm going to hand over to uh, Jansu to walk you through the BMAT. Yeah, and I also just noticed that Grace has joined us as well. So I just wanted to quickly introduce Grace, uh, who is our Oxford medic. So Grace, do you want to say hi? Yeah, hi everyone. I am a fourth year medic at Oxford. Um, I apologise for the scrubs. I've literally just got off my um, A&E shift. Um, but I'll be here to answer any questions you have, either specific to Oxford or about any of the application process at the end. I think scrubs fits, fits the occasion, actually. <laughs> um, so, uh, well, yes, yeah, so we have both um, both of our Oxbridge medics here. So obviously for Oxbridge and for some other universities, you need BMAT. So, uh, well, Maya, take us through the BMAT compared to UCAT. What is BMAT? Mm -hmm. Definitely. So it is a also a two hour exam, but you've only got three sections this time. And traditionally, it has been handwritten sat in person. Um, however, in the format for 2023 is yet to be decided based on COVID rules. Um, essentially, in your section one is what we call your thinking skills section, and it's testing your critical thinking and problem solving abilities. Section two tests your scientific knowledge. Um, so generally GCSE level, biology, chemistry, maths and physics. And section three is an essay writing section. So they're testing your ability to write a balanced argument and get your point across in a coherent manner. Um, they're not actually testing the content of your essay, they're testing your writing abilities. And we have, uh, just like we mentioned before, only a handful of universities that wants BMAT. So you have Oxford and Cambridge, of course, Imperial, which I've seen some of you uh, said that you were going to apply to. Um, then you have Leeds, UCL, Brighton and Sussex, Lancaster and Keele as, as well. So right now, you guys are at the start of your lower six. It probably sounds very, very early to start talking about an interview that's going to happen this time next year. However, fortune favours the prepared mind and we strongly advise that your preparation for the interview starts now. It's going to be part of the whole package, building towards this perfect application. And 
The interview probably matters more in a medical application than in any other university application, because if you're going to read medicine, you're going to be interviewed. It's virtually impossible to avoid. And not just that, there are different types of interview on the go. There's panel interviews, there's MMIs. Goodness knows what's going to be happening by the time that you uh, come around to be interviewed. So the preparation for interviews needs to start early and it needs to start consistently. So enough from me. I'm going to ask my what sounds like a very simple question. I'm sure it's going to wind up with a convoluted answer. But why is there so much emphasis on the interview? Why do the medical applicants have to be comfortable in that interview setting? OK, so medical medicine interviews are really, really important part of the application process, because this is when the admission staff who would be selecting you get to meet you in person. They get to know your personality. They get to know what you're like. They get to see how you interact with adults. And also, especially for Oxford and Cambridge, it's for them to evaluate, evaluate whether you'd fit into their university environment and whether you would thrive with their method of teaching. Um, and obviously, they're just checking your morals and your moral compass and making sure that your values are aligned to that of a doctor as well. So just making sure that uh, they're going to be hiring future doctors who will do well in the profession. Thanks. And of course, as we've established earlier, it would be easy if everyone was doing the same thing, but that's not how it works in medicine. So different types of interviews that people are going to have to face. Yeah, so this is just an overview of the different types that are offered at different universities. Each university has their preferred type. So most universities these days are using a format called MMI, also known as a multiple mini interview. Um, I will talk about those a little bit later on. Um, group interviews are group interviews. They're not very commonly used anymore. And then some universities, particularly the traditionally teaching ones, like to use panel interviews. And Oxbridge interviews are a type of panel interview. They're what we call an academic panel interview. Thanks. And we will prepare you for all of those. Now, let's have a little look at the interview itself. Yeah. So depending on the university, you're going to be invited to one, maybe two, maybe three interviews. Um, and as we said, they're checking to see how you would respond to a scenario that could be posed as a doctor. They're also going to be testing your basic ethical knowledge and making sure that your morals and values are correct and that you would respond to certain ethical situations in the way that the UK would expect a doctor to. You will also be asked to use your past experiences uh, to prove that you have the skills or are in the process of developing skills that you will need as a future doctor. Thank you. And as I said earlier, Everyone's coming at it from different angles. They're trying to get different little bits of information out of you. Uh, the non-Oxbridge ones will uh, go down the skill focus, the role play, whereas the there seems to be more of an emphasis really on the scientific and the, the problem solving on the Oxbridge side. Is, is, that, is that fair? Yes. So with the Oxbridge interviews, I think I'll talk about them a little bit later on, um, but they're much more academic focused. All the other interview types aren't academic at all. So we'll, we'll go through some of the differences. Great. So again, these are the type of things that are going to get chucked to you in those interviews. Yeah. So for your Oxbridge interviews, these are your academic panel ones. So it is panel style, but instead of being asked questions one on one, such as why do you want to be a doctor, you're going to be asked academic questions. So these are problem solving, um, you know, based on biology, chemistry, physics and maths, usually at BMAT level. But essentially, they're looking to see how you tackle new information. They're looking to see how you take on new information and whether you can use your prior knowledge to answer the question that's in front of you. Quite often, you're not going to know the answer. So it's important to think out loud in these interviews because they're interested in your thought process. Um, a few exciting points is that your interviewers are probably going to be your future teachers um, and you get to interview in the college that you're applying to, which is always a really exciting experience. Great. And here are some of the skills that they're expecting you to demonstrate while you're on your feet, while you're being chucked all of these incredibly hard questions, while you're being asked to reflect on your journey. Any which I don't know, is there any there that's more important than another? Um, I don't think so. I think it's important to have experiences 
that prove that you've got all of these skills. So this is what you should be working towards from now until next summer, or actually throughout your entire application process, to be honest. You wanna make sure that you have evidence um, that you have all of these skills. And if possible, can you link it to things that you saw on work experience? Can you link it to examples of doctors in action that you saw and therefore prove to those interviewers why these skills are really important? Most of your interview questions that are non-Oxbridge are going to be focused around this skill set and asking you how you developed skill X. What have you done to develop skill Y? That type of thing. Um, obviously, we just discussed what the interviews are, but you have to prepare for them in order to get your place. So walk us through, guys. So how do we prepare for these interviews? OK, so I think the easiest way to kind of lay it all out in front of you is to list all the experiences that you've had and then reflect on them. And in our workshops, we go through in a lot more detail how to reflect. But essentially, it's about what you learned, what you felt, what you gain, gained from it, and therefore how you're going to change going forward. You want to make sure that you've covered that entire skill set that we talked about a few slides ago. I think it's also really important to have some basic knowledge of things like the NHS structure, the history of the NHS, basic ethics. There is kind of just a guideline that all doctors in the UK have to adhere to. And also at the time of your interview, please, please keep up to date with any current news stories or like hot topics in the media, because they're really, really great to show your kind of appreciation for the subject and word of reading. Also be able to talk about yourself and do it in a concise way. You know, a lot of these interviews are timed, so you don't have um, much time. For example, in those MMI interviews, you have to speak for a set amount of time and then move on. And then for MMIs as well, you may or may not be asked to do a role play. And this is with an actor who is probably posing as a patient and you'll be given a scenario and you have to kind of just act with them and act in a way that a doctor would. So practice with these is most definitely really, really useful. Just grab a group of friends together and give yourself some scenarios. OK, and tips and tricks of how to do well as well. So I think confidence is the best thing you can do to do well in an interview. Even if you don't feel confident, just act it. That gives so makes so much of a difference. You know, speak to people around you, shake the interviewer's hand if they offer it, maintain eye contact, you know, don't stare at the floor or the table, making sure you have good posture. And that goes for if you have online interviews as well. Um, and in terms of answering the questions, try and talk about yourself. That's the whole point of an interview. Direct the questions to something that you've done or something that you found interesting. Um, and also, you know, making sure that you read up on the university. Why, you know, because a common question is, why do you want to come to this university out of all of the medical schools? So maybe, you know, go to the open day and have a bit of information about why you want to go to that medical school and why their course is interesting to you. And sometimes in panel interviews, you can be asked about your personal statement. So if you've written anything on there, you know, classically, it's writing about books that you haven't read. Make sure that you've read the books. Make sure you know your personal statement inside out. And since Oxford interviews are so different, how can we prepare for them? How can we maximise our chances? So in order to do well in an Oxford interview, you have to demonstrate your passion and excitement for science. And usually this is through being able to be proactive in the problem solving questions that they give you and being able to explain difficult concepts and difficult theories out loud um, and talking these you know, experts through your thought process, even if you don't know the answer to the, que to the question. They're also looking to see if you're going to contribute. So are you proactive? Are you asking questions? in a small group discussion, because these interviews are kind of a practice for those supervisions and tutorials that you would get in an Oxbridge, in, uh, in an Oxbridge supervision, sorry, in an interview, practice for the supervisions and tutorials, I got confused. Okay, and then again, in terms of just more preparation, making sure that you actually do enjoy science, don't apply for Oxford and Cambridge, if you're not willing to commit yourself to two or three years of scientific learning, um, potentially have a few topics up your sleeve that you've researched in further depth. Maybe you've done a research project in a particular topic of your interest. Uh, you know, some topics, uh, some colleges allow you to submit topics in advance that you want to talk about. Um, so just being prepared, 
reading around the subject and trying to push your A-level knowledge a bit further up until degree level will really help you. And then these are just some examples of common MMI interview questions. Um, interview questions are really freely available online, but you can see that they're more geared around skills and experience rather than academics. And then this is an example of an Oxford interview question, and you can see just how different they are. Um, so, for example, you could be given the genetic pedigree on the right hand side and just said and just told to discuss what you can see in the diagram. And that's the only prompt you're given. And you're, this is going to form the basis of your 30 minute interview. And you can see just how many layers that there are going to be added onto this. You're going to throw something out there. They will latch onto it and push you in a certain direction. Uh, they might give you more diagrams. So, for example, given a diagram of a chromosome and said, describe the locus shown by this chromosome. And, you know, there'll be lots and lots more information given to you. And essentially, they're just testing to see how well you can absorb that extra information and how well you take it on and how well you can integrate it with the knowledge that you already have. So how are we going to strengthen your application, Maya? OK, so the first thing I would say is to making to, is to make sure that you're aware of current affairs and especially medical news at the time of your interview, but also just throughout the next two years. Um, so these are also known as NHS hot topics. They pop up in BBC Health quite a lot. Um, so maybe bookmark that page and just keep an eye on it. Um, and essentially, there are lots of different examples of different current affairs that are happening. So, for example, this week I saw something about IBS and using hypnotherapy to treat IBS, which I thought was really interesting. Um, and there's always new and exciting research coming out every week. Just keep an eye on it. And it means that you can bring it out at an, at an interview and it proves that you are interested in medicine and you want to keep on top of things. Thank you. I mean, and the range of podcasts out there now that are engaging in all of this stuff in real great detail is fascinating. One of my private, one of my uh, favorite little columns is uh, MD in Private Eye. Uh, his uh, his uh, log of the uh, of the uh, of the pandemic was really quite extraordinary. So yeah, very very more accessible now uh, than ever, and you don't even have to read it; you can just listen to it in a podcast. Um, ethical dilemmas, definitely. So um, they. In interview, you will quite often be asked to give your opinion, but what you really want to be using is different ethical frameworks um, and respond to whatever the scenario is in the way that a doctor would. So there are different examples of ethical frameworks that you can use. Um, the four pillars of medical ethics are really, really useful. So these are beneficence, autonomy, non-maleficence and justice. Um, and essentially, if you read up on them, you can use them when answering questions and they're really useful as well. Um, oh, and they're coming from the screen now. And essentially, their interviewers are just testing to make sure that you are thinking and responding in the same way a doctor would. Obviously, you can go forth and read on really common ethical questions, things like abortion and euthanasia and the bed issue and the winter flu crisis and all of those really important things. Um, but if you have a framework that you can apply to your answer, that shows great maturity in reading. Thank you. And it also helps you structure your thinking, I imagine. If you go down that particular route, you approach things from a utilitarian perspective or a consequentialist, it just gives you that much more structure. And again, it's all about practice. Um, so, yeah, I'll skip through a couple of uh, slides there, but uh, medical ethics we've discussed. Uh, another favorite topic of mine, uh, really, um, more general medical issues. Definitely. So these are things just to be aware of because they plague the NHS every single year, pandemic or no pandemic. And it's really important just to be aware of them and be able to give your opinion. So things like the seven day NHS, um, potentially the coronavirus PPE struggle and therefore the economy and how the NHS is currently not being very well funded at all. Vaccines always crop up. Things like technology and AI and how what role that's going to play in the future, um, private healthcare and privatisation of the NHS, that comes up year on year. Things like the obesity crisis, ageing population, organ donation, 
um, again, are really, really interesting issues to have a look into. Um, so definitely spend some time researching them. They're really interesting. And again, great evidence to use when answering interview questions. And here's a real area where you can go on a deep dive into uh, some very, very technical and uh, challenging stuff. Yeah, and definitely here are some examples of like sort of key landmark cases that have happened over the past few years that you can use when answering different questions. So I'm not going to go into detail because I could talk for hours on them, but essentially have a look at these. They're very, very common. They're very well known. The Gillick Competence, uh, Lillian Boys, Hadiza Balgaba, Charlie Gard, a lot of you might have heard of him. The Abortion Act in 1990, I think that speaks for itself and the GMC's duties of a doctor. This is a document that the GMC lists that they hope all doctors will be able to adhere to. So definitely get familiar with that document because very, very soon you too will be um, adhering to it. Yeah, and of course these course, these uh, there are new cases emerging all the time. So another very good way of staying on top of, of current events. Um, a little bit about you, Maya, <laughs> if you don't mind. Yeah, this is just to finish it off. It's just a little recount of my medical ex school experience and how I found it so far. Um, so I entered in 2020. So I'm in my third year currently. I go to Murray Edwards College, which is one of the colleges in Cambridge. And I didn't have a conventional med school experience because all of my lectures were online, unfortunately. But I did get to do things like practicals and supervisions and dissections in person. Supervisions are such a good opportunity to learn from world class researchers in the field. Um, I can't express enough just how amazing an, ex an opportunity they are and dissection just a note on that if any of you are worried about something like that there it also is a really good learning opportunity as well um and essentially you get used to it and there's so much support out there if you're worried about it but go into med school with an open mind and wanting to learn the most that you can you honestly do get as much out of it as you put in Thank you very much. Thanks. Um, Grace, we don't have a slide for you, but uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about your background? Um, yeah, so as I said, I'm fourth year medic at Oxford. I'm at Exeter College. I started just before the pandemic hit, so I had about one normal term, um, but also had quite a lot of things online. But now I'm back to being full on in the ward. So I promise you, even with all that science, there is like a sort of light at the end of the tunnel. Um, I guess um, May will be in her interpolation year. So I've also just graduated with a BA in medical sciences with a specialism in neuroscience. So that's one of the really good things about going to Oxbridge and a lot of other medical schools offer it as well is that you can interplay and then you get to spend a year doing something slightly different, um, which is something that I really enjoyed. Well, again, thank you so much for coming along, still in your scrubs. You must be absolutely shattered. Um, is, is now the right time or the wrong time to ask you about Oxbridge life? Um, well, f fatigue is kind of, you get used to it. Um, but no, I really, really loved it. I think you get um, a large amount of variety. It's very different to anything I've ever done before. I come from Manchester, so Oxford is very much a bubble, but I'm very lucky to have experienced it. Um, so I really like it because I think having a collegiate system just makes you feel more at home. The universities are very big places. Um, I live in a little village near Manchester. I basically know everybody. I can go to the, um, go to the local shop and I bump into people I know. And it's a very similar thing with college. Um, you're in a year of around roughly 100 to 200 people and everything that you live in college, you have a bar in college, a library in college, and that's a really good way to make friends, especially non-medic friends. I think that's quite an important thing to make sure that you're not just... It is a very intensive course, whether it's five or six years. And I think college is a perfect way to be able to meet people from different courses. So right now I'm living with people who do biochemistry and earth sciences and such a variety. But then because you do everything in department, you still get to meet loads of other medics. So I think it's a really good balance. Thank you. Is it radically different at uh, Cambridge, Maya? No, Oxford is really, really similar to Cambridge. And I think that's the beauty of it. We also have colleges. It most definitely is a bubble here as well. It's just slightly different areas of the UK. Um, I think I'm biased towards Cambridge. I'm sure Grace is biased towards Oxford. <laughs> I'm sure we all have our biases, but is it how, how does it compare to what you thought it was going to be like? Um, I think nothing really ever prepares you to, for going to university. Um, there's so many different things you've got to juggle all by yourself all at once. Um, but I think 
what I wanted to say here was to just make the most of it. You know, societies and social life and world-class education, you've worked so hard to get to that point. So just make the most of it and enjoy every minute of it. Thank you very much. And uh, any advice that you wish you'd, uh, you'd be in a, in a position to give yourself, uh, give your younger self, sorry. I think just knowing that it's gonna be a lot of work and it's not going to be easy, but if you work hard, it most definitely is manageable and is a really, really rewarding degree. I love my degree. It's really interesting. I like doing the work. So I think that goes back to making sure you absolutely do want to do medicine and become a doctor. I think Grace will be able to speak about the clinical side of things. Yeah, I think the clinical side of things is a lot more like every other university. It's not as specific to Oxbridge. Um, it's like you would get if you went to Manchester or Sheffield. Um, I think one thing I would like to say in terms of just the general sort of Oxbridge experiences, I didn't realise how many brilliant people you would meet. Every lecture I have is somebody who's written the textbook that is used in every single university for it. I was sat next to Catherine Green yesterday, the woman who made the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine, and it's just incredible to be able to ask her questions. She actually, I was able to present my dissertation to her and just to be able to speak to people like that is you weirdly get used to it but every now and again I have to pinch myself and be like wow these are people who get OBEs and like are on the news like it's insane fantastic thank you so much um here's uh, another comment from uh, one of our students uh, the medicine bridging course has really helped me gain confidence yeah you're going into this thing it's a massive ordeal Everybody, everyone who's doing this is the very best in their school, best in their class. And so your confidence really matters. You might take a, a bit of a, a bit of a hit when it, things get hard, but you know, we work, we work with you, get you better all the time and build up that confidence. So even when the questions, uh, even when we don't get the questions right away in the course, the tutor always pushes us. So we still develop the right thought processes. So yes, you either you win or you learn. Uh, here we go. The I love the medicine bridging course because I enjoy science and it goes into a lot more detail than at school. It adds to my motivation because it's like a sneak peek of what you would learn at medical medical school. So yeah, it's a bit of a fast forward uh, into what's coming there. Sometimes all the steps of applying for medicine can be quite tiring, but the course helps me come back to what I really love about it and why I'm applying at all. So yeah, it is a draining process. It's a long and testing process designed to identify the truly excellent when everybody else is really good. Um, great. And I think- We're at the Q&A session, so. We're gonna break for the Q&A. One last chance then to scan that QR code. Um, actually, we're gonna keep the QR code up. So I think we can start answering questions um while you guys are filling the form so grace let's start with you um so somebody asked oh, would you still have to go through foundation year even if you didn't want to become a clinical doctor so is this would be post university and um, it that is very much dependent on what you want to go into if you never want to practice medicine ever then you do not need to do foundation years one and two but I wouldn't get bogged down into all the details um, right now. It is good to think about. Medicine is, whilst a lot of people think you only have one career option, you the amount of skills you get taught in a medical degree is insanity. Um, we get taught about um, having to work under pressure. I don't think there's any other thing you could, having to save someone's life really quickly is the most high pressure environment you could be in. So a lot of my friends actually are considering going off and going into medical law and going into medical consultancy and um, medicine is not going to shoehorn you down a particular career path if you want to go and do research after then you don't have to do foundation year one and two I would recommend it because if you've done the five or six years of medical school why not do two more and then you can take years out after that um, and also foundation years one and two there are certain circumstances where you can actually do it over four years and do it part time, for example, you know, if you've got a child or certain things, but I wouldn't get too bogged down in the detail then and there. The main thing is just being able to get into medicine in the first place. It is incredibly competitive. Um, so all of these programs can help you get really ahead and make sure you're doing really well in your um, in the admissions exams. Great. Yeah, that's... Uh, sorry. No, um, thank you. 
Sorry, sorry, Jansu. Uh, we've got a few questions coming through about the UCAT and the BMAT. Somebody asking if you can retake it. Well, the short answer is if you go on one of our courses, you shouldn't have to. Um, but um, Oxford, not interested in the UK CAT. Do we have a sense? Do you have any comments on people who might uh, apply uh, in consecutive years? I understand it's not something that uh, generally the admissions tutors tend to like. Uh, you, you can. Uh, I wouldn't recommend applying if you don't get into Oxbridge first time round you can apply again but they will be able to see that you haven't gotten in first time round and that often isn't taken well because unless it's an exceptional circumstance obviously it, you could have had a bereavement and they're incredibly understanding over that if it's a simple matter of you didn't score high enough the first time around on your exam when you should have they're gonna unfortunately see that as a bit of laziness and you've kind of fallen at the first hurdle. If you're applying to um, non-Oxford universities, I think they are a bit more lenient. Um, in terms of resitting the UCAT and the BMAT, you can only sit one exam per year. So you can resit the UCAT again, um, but you'd have to wait until the next round. Yeah, and again, that just demonstrates how important it is to get it right first time. Jansu. And uh, well, this one is for Maya. Um, so where would you recommend sixth form students who don't have connections to the NHS through family or friends uh, find work experience or volunteer work for their application? OK, so I completely understand. I didn't have any kind of connections whatsoever. And it just takes a bit of research and a bit of persistence. So I mentioned before, um, things like work experience programs, some hospitals run them. You just have to find them. Um, online work experience, again, quick Google should bring things up. Uh, volunteering, everyone always wants volunteers. You shouldn't struggle in finding volunteer work. Uh, hospitals always want volunteers on their children's wards or on their elderly wards. There's loads and loads of places you can volunteer, even volunteering in a nursery or a care home or a school. Anything where it's people-based will be useful. Um, I hope that helps. And uh, somebody else asked, uh, well, uh, is it okay if I only have volunteering experience and minimal to none work experience? What would you say to that, Grace? Very dependent on where that volunteering experience is. If that volunteering experience has been in a hospital, then you've probably picked up the same skills as you would, if not more, from doing work experience. And also it depends on where you're applying. If you're wanting to apply to Oxbridge, I would try and get at least three or four days in some research area. Um, I did research in AstraZeneca. I was in AstraZeneca for a week. I also went to um, a different lab for a week, as well as doing six months in a care home and a two weeks in a hospital. So that's the sort of level that they might be looking for. And that's why it's really important to start early. I think it relates to a question asked, or I saw a question asked earlier on, whether it's good to do work experience in year 11. There's never a bad time to do work experience. I, I've done work experience every year some from year 10 to year 13 so I think that's four years of it and then volunteering they want to see dedication they want to see you doing it over a prolonged period most people who apply will have at least six months of volunteering in a care home so that's kind of the baseline they're looking for thank you I think there's a question here about mini courses I guess that's uh, something along the lines of a MOOC um do the admissions tutors like to see evidence of MOOCs? Is that something that's going to strengthen an application when it's going through? And does it matter where it comes from? Um, yeah, I think anything where you are sort of furthering your knowledge and demonstrating your scientific enthusiasm is great. It doesn't really matter the format in which that comes from. Um, I think if you can demonstrate that you have gone above and beyond your A-level syllabus, and you are trying to learn something that's of a level higher than you're doing in school. And then you can use that in your interviews and or in your personal statement. I think that would be the most beneficial thing for you. And it doesn't make a difference if you have three versus four A levels. What would you say, Grace? This, not really. I only did three, but I only did three because I was only allowed to do three. So universities will not the reason why they only require three is because there were some schools that only give you three. Um, if it's a choice, personally, if I get, was to give you advice, I'd say do three and be able to spend the time you would be doing four and extra doing these, doing like our programs and doing BMAT and UCAT help, that would be most useful. And um, there is no requirement to do four. And my best advice would be to do three and excel in those three, get your A stars and so on and so forth. But again, if you are doing four, 
the universities will still see that as they're not going to see that as a bad thing don't be like oh i'm panicking i'm now doing four um at the end of the day you're going to be getting more skills from that but they're not going to discriminate against you if you have three great a uh, quick question on college choice um does college choice matter at all is that something that people should be stressing about i no, I don't think so. I think it's dependent. I can't speak for Oxford, for Cambridge. Everyone gets the same teaching. Uh, for medicine, the teaching is centralised. So you will be doing all your lectures and practicals with the entire year group across all the different colleges. The only thing that differs is the supervisions, but they're small group teaching and you still get great opportunities, whichever college you go to. The only things that differ between the colleges are things like the accommodation and the distance from the centre to town. So things like that matter, which for a lot of people they do, that's the only thing I would be thinking about, but not in terms of the teacher. Uh, somebody asked, um, are GCSEs really important, especially if you're aiming for a very competitive university like potentially Oxford Imperial? Uh, I would definitely say so. Um, and let's see. So, well, somebody else asked, when would you recommend start preparing for UCAN and BMAT? Well, we are having this webinar right now and our courses are starting in the second week of November for year 12 students. So I, we will always recommend that you start as early as possible uh, because again, it makes things easier on your part as a student. Um, so let's see, uh, would you say doing an EPQ will help with section three in the BMAT and will it be useful as I have to, as I have to decide if I want to do it? Um, so what would you guys say? I'd say not too much for um, section three. It's not going to disadvantage you. I think an EPQ is very good to show you've got research interests, which would be good to talk about in your personal statement, particularly if you're thinking of applying to a research heavy university, so Oxbridge or London. All right. Very, very, very interesting. Um, and let's see, uh, is there a timer for each question during BMAT and UCAP? No, there isn't, unfortunately. The sections are timed themselves, there's a little timer in the corner, but it's not per question. So say you've got 21 minutes for verbal reasoning, you'll have a 21 minute timer. And then when it gets to the end of the 21 minutes, that section will be stopped and the next section will begin. Similar thing with BMAT, it's three sections, but they're three, se they're three separate papers. They run continuously, but someone will give you section one, take section one, give you section two, take section two. So you really need to, um, you need to be good across the board because you can't make up time in one area and spend on another. A couple of questions on the fifth choice. Obviously, you're only allowed to put down medicine four times. Any areas that you would stay, which, which degree courses would you recommend as that fifth choice? 95% of people apply for biomedical sciences because um, there is a large amount of overlap. And I would recommend applying to, for the fifth choice, apply to a university you've already applied to for medicine because then it's very clear to them why your personal statement is medical based. Um, I did that for Leeds for biomedicine and I got the offer for both, even though my personal statement said medicine throughout. I just think that's a better idea. Great. Uh, let's have a look. Oh, I've got a few. Sorry, very quickly. So somebody asked, is year 11 a good time to start work experience? I think Grace, you've already said yes. Yeah, great. Um, for an Oxbridge medic, once the first degree is obtained after the third year, are students required to submit an application for admission to the fourth to the sixth year? Do you have to reapply, basically? It's quite confusing. You're guaranteed to get a space, but you do have to fill in more forms, if that makes sense. Your space is guaranteed, but you do have to send off an official application, which will be accepted. Got you. Are BMAT and UCAT questions reused or are they different every time? Now for BMAT, they are gonna be pretty much different every time. For UCAT, like it is computerized, but I'm pretty sure like there's such a huge bank that you wouldn't really receive the same question again. And if you did it again, it would be the next year. And yeah, it, it's unlikely. Um, do we have a YouTube channel that goes through BMAT or UCAT questions? Well, what we do have is a huge bank of video resources. Um, and they aren't on YouTube, I'm afraid, because we've got literally thousands of them. Um, but it is something that's available as part of our program. So now is an ideal opportunity for, to remind you to get that QR code scanned if you would like access to that bank. Um, in terms of the price of the program, we do have a variety of different uh, prices, price points to our program. Um, they are paid programs, um, but we have different options available depending on how much support we believe you need. And really, the best thing is to get yourself booked into a consultation so that we can give you the best advice. 
um, and give you the program and advise you about the program that would best suit you. Somebody said they've got an, a degree in environmental sciences from Kenya that have had to change their career paths. And they were wondering, is it possible for them to apply to medicine in the UK with their spousal visa? And if so, do they need to start from scratch as well? Or do they need to have a foundation here? I'm not sure if we know the answer. Do, do we know the answer to that question right now, Grace? Um, I don't know. She can definitely apply. I just don't know whether that would be as a UK or an international student. So you can apply either way. There is no foundation course for medicine. You would either be entering as an undergraduate or as a graduate. Um, and that just depends on what universities accept as like acceptable grad um, undergraduate courses to then go into graduate medicine. Just as an ex-international student uh, who came to the UK, uh, I doubt that will be on the spousal visa. I believe you would still have to get your own student visa because the university itself has to sponsor you. Um, just as a side note over there. Um, and I do and think there's one university that offers a foundation year to international students, but that's the University of Central Lancaster. I oh, think yeah. that's, that's a one-off, but um, there we go. Oh, what are the most common mistakes made during interviews, Grace? What would you say? Not being able to state what you've learned from something, just listing things off and not showing an awareness of what's going on in the world. And I think that's particularly important right now. We're cycling through prime ministers at a rate of knots and we're in an absolutely awful cost of living crisis. And if people don't mention that, I think that is absolutely silly because it's going to affect everything from how much money the NHS actually has um, to people's mental health can they heat their homes can they eat so like my one bit of advice for interview prep that you can kind of do yourself without help from like us and without um kind of having to practice with someone else is watch bbc news and watch it every day okay bbc news is going to become your you guys new religion at this point <laughs> um so what are the differences between postgrad medicine and undergrad medicine literally not much postgrad medicine you do it in one year less so they just like condense it together and um, everything you have to le le learn to become a doctor in the UK no matter what uni you go to is the same because it's a GMC accredited course it's accredited by the government so everything you learn whether you go to Oxbridge or whether you go elsewhere will be the same you will just do it in more detail if you go to Oxbridge and uh, somebody asked, well, uh, since our personal statements will be written for medicine, medicine, will we have to submit a separate personal statement specific to the fifth choice? No, you can't. So the way UCAS works is you have one personal statement that gets sent out to all five. Hence my only recommendation of biomedical sciences because it is the closest with the most overlap, particularly applying to a um, fifth university, which you've already sent your personal statement off to medicine. Universities cannot see what other universities you've applied to, but they can see if you've applied to that university for a different course. So say if you applied to Leeds for biomedical sciences and Leeds for medicine, they would see both of those applications and then it would click in their heads as to why you've written this bit of a non-relevant personal statement. And in a way, they're kind of like, this person really loves this university and they're more motivated to give you the fifth offer it has been my personal experience of this. And what are the, some misconceptions about medicine or studying medicine that you think that medicine students should be aware of or potential medicine students should be aware of? My misconception when coming to Oxbridge was all degrees would do the same amount of work. And that definitely was absolutely abolished from Freshers Week. I had two essays that I had to complete during Freshers and the workload has been on a very high level since I've gotten here. And I don't want to say that to put people off, but if... I know applying and doing the UCAT and the BMAT and the personal statement and having to do everything at once is very stressful. It is pretty much nothing compared to what you're going to get when you actually get in. So if you don't think you can hack it, definitely don't. I mean, not definitely don't, but have a real consideration as to whether you think you can do it for five, if not six years. And it's backing onto a question I saw earlier. And I get asked this commonly. People often think A levels is the hardest time in your um, academic life. And if you try and do medicine at Oxbridge, A levels will seem a walk in the park. Um, so that's just something to consider. There's a uh, there's a question just popped up there towards the end, which uh, I, I'm going to feel because it's something I've done uh, a mistake, of which I'm guilty. What is your advice if they ask you about a current issue or a topic that you don't know much about in an interview? For the love of everything holy in this world. Just admit it. Don't try to bluff. 
do not try to bluff because you will be found out and it will all go spectacularly wrong from there. They don't expect you to know all of the answers. I mean, if it's current, current, current issue or topic, current affairs, then you probably should do. But if it's something that you don't know, um, front up, because otherwise you will walk yourself into a, into a whole world of trouble. So be honest in those interviews. And if you don't know, ask. That's a very, that's a demonstration of a strong character. Just saying, I don't know. We haven't covered that. Please help. Any other top tips for interview? Again, a lot of things you can answer with the same framework. So like ethical questions, um, the Archie Battersby case is quite a hot one that's going to come up. It's kind of like the new Charlie Guard. And if you've not heard of the Archie Battersby case, you can talk about it with the same frameworks as you could with the Charlie Guard case. It's the same ethical pillars that you talk about. And I think it's often best to answer medical questions thinking about things which are non-medical related. So like if I think about elderly people, I think about my grandma. OK, what's my grandma? What's she more susceptible to? I know she's on antihypertensive, so she's got high blood pressure. Why might that be? And does my grandma, um, in terms of thinking about how the pandemic's changed the NHS, they try and do online consultations. And my grandma doesn't have Wi-Fi, let alone know how to use an iPad. She would be, that's a massive barrier. So it's really relating it to your own life. And I think just be relatable because everyone at some point comes in contact with healthcare. I was born in a hospital. That's my contact that I've had. Everybody will have had contact. You would have had vaccinations when you were younger. You would have had checkups and um, like booster jabs. So everyone has had some form of like contact with it and talk about it. And you're incredibly lucky if you've not had any family member have contact with the NHS either because 95% of people would have. So to be as relatable as possible. Um, I just seen a very interesting question there. Somebody asked, um, has any of your tutors worked with you in order to get to Oxford? And actually, some of them have. Um, so, I mean, guys, we've been doing this for seven years. Um, so, yes, some of them actually have. But uh, that doesn't give you a right for us immediately tutor. So because you have to go through the selection process all over again, just like everybody else. Um, but yeah, that's always a full circle moment for us, obviously. Um, and yeah, as the last question, um, well, someone says, um, say your predicted grades do not meet the entry requirement and you do not get an offer or an interview, but on results day, you get the required grades, then what would happen? Like the, would the unis try to contact you? What would happen, Grace? No, if you've not been given an offer, they will not contact you. You can try and reapply next year. Similar thing to what I said before regarding the exams, unless you have a sort of I want to say like I don't like to use with acceptable reason but there are certain reasons that the universities will be very understanding about severe mental health issues um, family bereavements maybe really bad financial problems and therefore if you reapply and you've got those written on your UCAS you'll be looked at very fairly by universities if it's simply because you haven't got the predicted grades because unfortunately you didn't put the work in when you really should have they are not going to look at that um very well as we saw with the stats before i think the success rate to get into oxbridge medicine um is bordering on six or seven percent unfortunately if as soon as they see you haven't got the predicted grades you're going to be tossed off the pile and they're going to look at the other four thousand people they've got applying who have all got the predicted grades so that sounds harsh but there's no point wasting an application if you haven't got the grades to begin with exactly and that's why it is very important for you guys to start working early because you guys are aiming high. I mean, medicine itself is already a very high goal. And then if you want to apply to which from what we saw in the beginning of uh, the webinar, you guys said Oxford, Cambridge, Imperial, UCL, KCL, these are all even more competitive within the medicine field. So if you guys start early, you can make that application more competitive. Um, that's going to be it for today, guys. Well, thank you so much for, uh, well, Maya had to leave. But thank you so much to Maya, even though she's not here. And Grace, obviously, you were fantastic. Thank you so much for um, sharing a lot of useful information with our students. Um, um, well, thank you so much for participating in the questions and the polls and everything. It was a pleasure to explain the medicine fields for you guys. And well, looking forward to speaking with you, some of you um, in the consultations. Take care, everyone. Thank you, everybody. Good night.